Well, welcome back to week two. Um, you finished, hopefully, your homework of week two. If you haven't, that's okay. Um, you'll just grow so much more if you can. So I really would encourage you to do it. I tried very hard to make the homework not too time consuming, but just a little bit of devotion every day. So I'm hoping that uh, you can get it done. Um, but now that you're listening to the video before your discussion group, um, I hope that uh, we can dig a little deeper and um, just make you ponder it a little bit more before your discussion group. I do ask you to get your Bible out and uh, if you need to stop this, get your Bible out, get a pad of paper, because I am going to ask you to take some notes and then you can share what you learned um, with others and with your discussion group. So um, let's get going. Um, I do, today we're talking specifically about how to know that we have saving faith, that you have eternal life. Um, this is a really big uh, question, isn't it? And today we're actually going to answer that. How do you really learn and how do you know that you have saving faith? Jesus told a parable of the soils. He, um, when in, in the Gospels, he said that there are some that go on rocky soil, meaning they, uh, the word, they hear the word, and they understand the word, but um, their hearts are sort of rocky. And so when the word implants, it doesn't have roots and it doesn't go very deep. So then when the trials come and hard times come, well, it just the roots won't hold it, and so it'll fall away. He also talks about some are thrown on thorn, uh, thorny grounds, and he says that the anxiety and the deceitfulness of wealth and the things of this world will, as it tries to grow, will just choke it out, that life. And some seeds are um, sown on good soil, and those people hear and understand that they produce fruit. So that sort of helps us start today off with that idea of that some of us might be planting the word and the truth of God on rocky and thorny soils where we let the trials and the um, worries of the world and the desires of the world to choke out and not have great depth. Well, the goal of this study is to have us grow deeper and understand more and be more confident that we actually have saving faith but there'll be some alongside of us, and some even in this study, that will think they're a believer, but trials and um, desires of this world will reveal that their heart was not on good soil. But even if that's true with you, there are things we can learn, we can grow, and we can say, Lord, now I have a soft heart. And I want to plant this word on good soil so I can produce fruit. So that's the goal um, of what we're doing. But how do you know if you have a, a, a heart that is, that is uh, ground in your heart that is just rocky or, um, or thorny? Well, trials. Challenges in life will, ch will show, will prove what we truly believe. So everyone in the world experiences trials. It's the consequences of the fall. Um, we all, since then, have been separated from God. And trials help us to seek God, which is our only true good. So today we're going to talk about what is the purpose of trials and um, how we can walk in them and grow in them and embrace them. Uh, as opposed to people in the world who will shun them and, and hate them and not trust God in them. So anyway, let's begin with prayer. And that gives you a little clue where we're going. But let's begin in prayer and we'll go from there. Almighty, all-wise God, give us your wisdom to trust you. You constantly need to refresh our minds of what is true. Teach us and remind us, excite us of what's to come. Remind us this world is not eternal. And you and our lives um, are, are, are the only option, the only hope of eternal life. 
We want to invest in that life. We want to invest in our eternal life. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, even Satan and the demons. And we also know that even now, no purpose that you plan will be stopped. Lord, help us to put our trust in you. Help us to realize you are the only one with wisdom. Help us to know and embrace your plans for us. Open our eyes to look past the seen to the unseen, Lord, to, to what's really happening. Open our eyes to see your goodness. And Lord, also help us to encourage each other as we pray for one another in our discussion groups that we wouldn't do fluffy prayers, but that we would actually pray to help strengthen and uh, grow each other's faith. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, okay, let's jump on in to um, James, if you've got your Bibles, James chapter 1. Hopefully you're open to James. Um, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let it, that endurance have its perfect result, that you may be complete, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, the passage we're going to be dealing with today is, is the memory verse that you've been working on, and hopefully just by working on it, it made you ponder and think about it, and we're going to now break it apart into its little pieces, and, and then we'll um, pull back the layers so we can see a little bit deeper. It starts with consider or count it all joy, depending on your version. Consider means ponder, think about, count it. Um, it means it's something in your mind that you're going to do. And it, uh, well, it's trials, but so much more. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. So we're still looking at what is it. But consider, ponder, think about it, which we don't know what it is, all joy. And joy, um, let me add this. Joy is not happy. Joy is much, much deeper. Um, my best example of that, especially to women, is having a baby. When we have a baby and we go through the pain that we go through, um, I wouldn't say that that is a happy thing. <laughs> I don't go, oh, he gets to go into labor and this is happy. But I would say it's joyful because it's joyful because the baby is going to come out and you're going to get a baby um, and what joy that baby will bring you over the years. So uh, that's an example of joy and not happy. Where a party, you could be happy but not necessarily joyful. Um, so that's what we want to talk about is joy is much deeper than happy. So consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters. Um, when we think, first he talks about, this is brothers and sisters in Christ, that the only people, the only people in this world who truly can consider it, which we'll talk about in a second, all joy is brothers and sisters in Christ. And what do they consider all joy as brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, it goes on, and now we start to begin to understand the it. When you encounter various trials. Well, encountering various trials is sort of an interesting thought. Um, in the Greek, the idea is it's, um, it's actually multicolored, multi-sized trials. So um, some are purple, some are red. Um, some are small, some are big. It has this various multicolored trials. So consider all my joy, my brethren, uh, my brothers and sisters, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Sorry, I learned the, the passage in a particular version, so sometimes you'll hear me use that version. But consider all my joy, joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing. Ah, now we were told at the beginning to consider, ponder think about, and now it's saying knowing. Well, this is what we're supposed to consider and ponder and think about. What do we know? And this is why it's saying this is what you'll know, and this is why you consider those various trials, those all-colored, all-variety-of-sizes trials, 
We know that the testing, um, well, that word testing in Greek, if you spent the time to look it up, um, it, it, that word testing, I'd like you to write something in your Bible. It's actually translated, the exact same word is translated a different word in 1 Peter 1, 7, where it also is talking about trials, but it uses, instead of the word testing, it uses the word proof. Now, you might say, well, what's the difference, testing or proof? Well, some testing is done to see if it's any good. You know, test this soup to see if I put too much salt in it. Well, that's, you know, to test to go, oh, I don't know, Carol, yeah, up, oh, you did it, up, oh, yeah, you didn't do it. This is more like my saying, hey, test my cooking because I know it's good and it'll prove to you that you like it. So um, if somebody says, hey, I don't know if I like that, what you cooked, and I'm like, oh, test it, treat, taste it, and you'll find out. It'll prove to you that it's good. So this is that type of testing. This is a testing that proves. So now we can almost use that word proof. Well, actually, we can't almost. We can use that word proof, and I actually prefer it better. So when I memorize it, <coughs> I memorize both that word and the word proof in it. So knowing that the proof, the testing, the proof of your faith produces perseverance. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you counter various trials, knowing, this is what we know, that the proof of our faith produces endurance when we prove our faith. Well, endurance, that's another great Greek word. And I also like using this specific Greek word. I actually use it, uh, uh, I memorize the word, is it's called hupomone. Um, the reason why I use it is I find sometimes in languages there's some words that you just can't, um, uh, there's no other word that you can use other than that word. And so knowing that the testing of your faith produces hupomone, perseverance, endurance. Well, hupomone means hyper under, so it means like uh, um, uh, a sense, it's, it's, it, what it really means is that you become strong and you remain under pressure. Trials are like pressure on us and uh, the endurance or perseverance or hupomone is remaining under that pressure. Um, some of you have heard me tell you this story, but one time I was listening to an interview of an amazing woman who's a believer, and she was telling about her life, and she had lived in a time where it was very difficult, and um, it's, they call it the killing fields, where um, she grew up, and when she was a young girl, uh, all of her village, uh, they, they were told by the enemy to dig a big hole and, um, and then they dug a big hole and then the enemy shot the whole village and they all fell into the hole and um, they left them for dead. Well, this little girl fell into the hole with everyone else, but she didn't get shot. Everyone else did, but she didn't. And so she waited there several days um, scared that somehow somebody would see her move and shoot her. So she just waited there amongst her family and everyone else that was dying, that was dead until she could crawl out and crawl out of those fields and, and go um, somewhere. She came to know the Lord and um, so that's why I heard her testimony. But her testimony, um, at one point in time she's talking through the testimony and, and people are talking to her and they said, um, you know, uh, you know, don't you, you know, how do you get out of a trial? And she says to them, oh, you stupid Americans, you all think alike. And I was thinking at the time, like, what do you mean? How do I think wrongly? And she said, you know, you all try to get out of a trial. So it's like, oh, we just hope you can get out of it as quick as possible. I hope it ends quick. And she says, that's not what I pray for. I pray that the Lord will strengthen my back so that the trial doesn't crush me. 
That's hupa mone. That it's saying, Lord, that our backs would be strong enough that the trial, the pressure of this trial to doubt our faith, to, to doubt God's goodness, won't crush us. But we will continue. We will hupa mone. We will keep going. Um, that, the, that the trials of life won't crush us. When you think of that, that's what we need to pray for one another. Not that someone would be able to have what they want. Um, it's, it's difficult, you know, when I ask for people's prayer requests, often they say, well, I pray that, you know, I, I can have certain things I want to have, an outcome I want in life. And that's fine. The Lord knows that we're weak and we need Him. But at a deeper level, at a deeper understanding, what we want to pray for one another is to hoop a monet to be able to be stronger, to be able to maintain under, to be able to handle this pressure that, that this trial won't, won't hurt our faith, that we will remain under and that we'll be able to handle it until the Lord brings us through. And that in the end, we will see the Lord's goodness in it. Well, um, let's go back to, it says, knowing that the testing, the proof of your faith and that's what I said, write the word proof. Uh, it produces endurance, perseverance, and you might want to write hupon bonne, because maybe that'll, that'll, it did in mind, once I learned this, it stuck in my mind, to remain under pressure. So, um, that the proof of your faith produces endurance, hupon bonne, and let that endurance, the hupon bonne, have its perfect result. Oh, what is the perfect result? of hupo mone, if we remain under, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Wow, that is amazing. And that's what hupo mone does, is it makes us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So now I told you I was going to tell you what it was. <laughs> Consider it all joy. Well, it is not just the trials. Um, the example of having a baby, the, the, the it is not just the labor. The it is the goal of the baby. It's the whole thing that you'll go through the labor and you'll have the joy of the baby. Well, it is the proof of your faith, the hupomone that makes you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Ah. So it is, yes, trials, but so much more. Now, I'd like you to take notes on this, and I'd like you to, if you can, to go back and ponder what I'm about to tell you right now. Dr. MacArthur gave um, eight purposes for trials that come out of the scripture. And I think those are really helpful, because when we go through trials, sometimes we're like, man, this is hard. Well. Um, one, which comes out of this text right here, is that a trial will prove your faith. It'll prove what you believe. When life gets hard and um, we all of a sudden decide, you know, following the Lord is too hard, many will fall away. Many will say, I'm not doing this anymore. It's a persecution. Forget it. I'm out of here. Um, so trials prove what do you really believe? What's really your convictions? And that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that you'll walk through the trial saying, wow, look at me, I walked perfectly. No, it means that as you worked through a trial and after it's all said and done, wow, you're still coming back to church. You're still hanging in there. You're still persevering. You're still hupomone under the Lord and his hand. Um, I've been through trials that have been hard. Some of them have been very difficult, at least for me. And um, I remember afterwards saying, Lord, I really don't understand why I've had to go through this. I really don't see, I, don't, I didn't see you, I didn't understand what was going on. And um, months later, after it was all said and done, I felt like God was saying, yeah, but Carol, you're still here. And I'm like, well, not pretty, not well, nothing I can brag about, nothing I can say, hey guys, listen, I learned, you know, I'm, I'm so great, I, I walked this by faith. But 
just by continuing and not giving up. It reminds me of that passage with the disciples when um, when Jesus said, you have to eat of my blood and drink of my flesh, and they had hundreds of people there at the time, and they all said, whoa, he's talking cannibalism. This guy's weird, and they all left him. And he went to his 12 disciples, and he says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says to him, Lord, and I, I'm going to add some words to the text, <laughs> which I believe was there in his heart. If I could, I would. But this is what he did say. But you have the only words of eternal life. How can I leave you? You're my only hope. That is the, the sounds of a true believer. That there are times when we want to leave our faith. And we were like, man, this is just hard. I wish I didn't have to go through this. But, but a true believer will realize that their only hope is God and their only hope is Jesus Christ and that it's all true and the true believer will hupomone. So many times when um, I have the opportunity to go to many churches and sometimes I won't see people for 10 years but often when I see them um, it encourages my heart not because they have such a strong walk at the moment or not because of anything in particular, but that they're still here. They're still following the Lord, trying to follow the Lord. That is a good sign of your proof of your faith. But, okay, so that's number one. And I said there was eight, so I'm going to go through this quick, hopefully. Um, the second one is to remind us to trust the Lord and not what we see. So one of the things of trials is it helps us to trust the Lord and not in what we see. And um, it will, uh, the more we go through trials, the more we start to realize and reminds us, you're right, I need to trust the Lord and not in what I think is going on right here. That's what a trial will do for you. Number three, a, a trials wean us from our desire of the world. They start to make us realize that nothing in this world satisfies. We have a trial because we think sometimes things satisfy us here. And then we try them and then we realize, no, they don't. And that weans us like a, like a baby. It takes us away from the desires of this world because we're like realizing, no, that's a lie. It won't, it won't satisfy. Number four, it are, increases, trials increase our desire of hope for eternity and heaven. And heaven. Um, I know for me, it's like I've lived enough of life that I'm like, I just don't trust anything here to really truly satisfy anymore. So it does increase my desire for what potentially the Lord's talking about that, um, that I will be disappointed. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, another thing trials do is they reveal what we truly love. So sometimes I say, oh, I love you, Lord. But then a trial comes along and I'm like, yeah, I love you, Lord, but I want life to be the way I want it to be. Wow, that's what I truly love is what's here. Um, and so many times trials reveal in our heart what we truly love. Number six, trials can teach us to value God's blessings. When things are at risk and things are taken away, I know my children, two of them, lost their jobs during COVID. Um, and I think they just felt like they could get a job anytime, anywhere, because that was what was happening at this time and where they live. But um, now I think they really, truly value that God gave them work. Um, and they really see it as a blessing. And they don't take it for granted anymore. So the trial of losing their jobs and having to find another one was good for them to realize that it actually is a blessing to have a job at all. Um, number seven, trials strengthen our perseverance, hupomone, to handle greater pressures for greater usefulness. So the more we hupomone, the more useful we are in the kingdom to help 
in many ways. Um, but uh, just right now, I'll just say it just helps with you being more useful in the kingdom and for God's kingdom. And number eight, uh, according to MacArthur, it enables us to comfort others um, in their trials if we've gone through trials. So those are eight things that MacArthur said. I'm going to add one more, and it's based on my study of the book of Job, that trials um, help us have a, a, a more eternal purpose understanding. That um, through the book of Job, we learn that trials uh, can prove God right, that he's right. And it'll show the foolishness of evil, which he did um, in Job when he went through that, those big trials. It showed that, uh, that evil and Satan was foolish in the thinking that they're right and not God. And lastly, which is, which is really wonderful, is it puts evil in its place. So the trials that we go through, God is, is, is purposely moving in a direction to prove God right, evil foolish, and, and evil will finally be put in its place. And man, do I look forward to that day when all evil is put away. So um, trials are what gets us there. Uh, we don't always understand them because it's way bigger than us and we don't understand a lot of things. So, um, but we can and we should consider trials and what I mean by that is everything about it, what I just talked about, all those nine things I just talked about, um, consider it all joy um, when we encounter trials. So how do we walk by faith? How do we hoop on Monet? You know, that's the real thing. It's like, Carol, that's all good, and I took your notes, and I, and I see this, but I'm going through something, and, you know, there's an there's a old um, say that they always talk about believers, that you're either going through a trial, you've just finished a trial, or you're about to begin one, which is probably true with every one of us. Um, so how do we walk by faith and how do we hoop a monet? How do we remain under the pressure? Well, the text is wonderful because it just keeps going and it gives you exactly what the next thing you need. Well, we need God's wisdom because this is bigger than us. We don't even understand what the purpose is. I mean, if the world, according to me, everything would be never having a challenge. Um, everything would just like go along smoothly. But we all know that that, if you haven't figured that out yet, maybe some of you haven't, but any of you have lived any part of life, you start to realize that that's actually not good. That if everything went according to me, well, one, I probably wouldn't seek God because I would think I had it all figured out. Um, trials have helped me understand God so much more and show my need for him. And also trials have made it where I don't realize that nothing in this world can satisfy but him. So I need God's wisdom to walk um, in a trial. And I need, because I need to walk by, I don't want to walk by sight, I want to walk by faith. So I don't want to just do what I think needs to happen, like yell at that person or you know, try to fix it on my own. I want to walk by how God wants me to walk. I want to walk by faith. So let's read on and um, in James and see what it says on how to get God's wisdom. Uh, let's read James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Verse 5, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to, to all generously and without reproach, it will be given to him. Let's we'll stop just right there. Um, if you lack wisdom, what are we supposed to do? Ask. Ask God. And how does God give? Look at the verse. How does God give? Generously and without reproach. God is a giving God. He gives. And he gives generously. More than, you know, shaken down, more than you possibly need. And without reproach means he won't uh, say, how dare you, Carol, have asked? I mean, you should know this by now. He'll never do that. So he says, if you lack wisdom, 
He will give to you generously all you need, and he will not rebuke you, and it will be given to you. But he gives you a reason, a, a something that you need to know, which is, but he must ask in faith. So if you ask of God, you have to believe um, and have faith without doubting. And then, and then let me read on, verse 6, 7, and 8. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, if we need to ask in faith without doubting, um, doubting is like being in the surf of the sea, driven and tossed. Now, those of you who have been in the sea, you know what that feels like. Those who have not been in the sea, well, imagine being the washing machine <laughs> and your head and your body is like, and you don't even know which way is up or down. You don't have a clue. He says that's what it's like when you're doubting. You don't know which way is up or down. You don't even know where to find air or where not to find air. He says, when you're like that, don't expect to receive anything from God because you're double-minded. You say, I want to follow God, but I want my ways. Now, you might say, okay, what does that look like, Carol? Well, there's a, a, a king in the Bible, King Zedekiah, if you ever want to study, it's for interesting, um, in the book of Jeremiah. But King Zedekiah was one of the last kings and um, he kept going to Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, tell me what I should do. And Jeremiah would say, well, you need to open up the gates to the enemy and let them in because the only way you're going to live is if you go under the Babylonians. And Zedekiah was like, okay, thanks. But then he'd be like, oh, but I don't know if I want to do that because that could hurt, you know, and that could, maybe I could die if I open up the gates and... I don't know, and these liars over here are saying, no, let's, you know, we're, we're stronger than the enemy, we'll, we can maintain. I, uh, I think I'll listen to them. And so he ignores Jeremiah. And then later on, more trouble happens. Then he goes, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, really, what should I do? And Jeremiah says, open up the gates and let them in. And Zedekiah says, mm, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. And Jeremiah says, Zedekiah, if you do not open up the gates, what's going to happen is they are going to come in and they're going to kill every one of your sons. And, and Zedekiah is like, ooh, that's bad. Oh, yeah, no, I should follow God. But uh, I don't know. So here's an example. He was double-minded. He wanted to know what God wanted it, God said, but then he really didn't want to obey it. So if you don't want to obey what he says, don't ask, because you're not going to get it. Zedekiah ended up not opening the gates, and the Babylonians did come in. They did get Zedekiah. They did kill all of his sons and blinded him before, and he died on the way to Babylon. But he would have, it would have gone well with him had he listened to God and obeyed, but he didn't. He didn't walk by faith. He wanted answers but he only wanted to know what he wanted to know. So you have to ask by faith, saying, God, you truly know. And if you remember, I had you look up two verses in Hebrews of what faith was. But I really want to focus on the second one in Hebrews 11:6, 6. That faith is believing that he is, that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. It's believing that God is, and that he rewards those who seek him. Those two things, that's faith. Well, often we find that, um, you know, when we go through trials, that we're like, you know, I don't think God, he doesn't, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what I'm going through, or he doesn't care. Um, this is crazy. He's, he's totally made a mistake. His purposes are wrong. I shouldn't be going through this. Or, um, or I've had enough. I don't need any more. Those are some things that we say when we're in a trial. And all of those show that you either don't believe he even is there, or you don't believe that he has a good plan. Either one, you are without faith. You are not trusting that he is truly there 
and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And that's where we constantly have to, those of us that are believers, have to keep challenging ourselves. And I, I really want you to think of those two things, especially through this whole study of James. Is, do I really believe that he exists, that he's really here, and that he really has a good plan, and that he'll reward in due time? Um, that will keep you with faith, and that will keep you not double-minded. So as we walk through life, that's how we're going to find God's wisdom. Is Because if we're without faith, he will not give it to a double-minded man. But with faith, he gives generously, without reproach. That's wonderful. Um, so why can we ask the giving God for wisdom? Because... He gives generously and without reproach. So something else we need to know as we walk on this earth, um, and God explains this, and this is a little quick thing that I'm going to go through. I won't spend too much time on it, but I think you need to, um, hopefully you got it in your homework. But verse 9 through 11, it says, um, Now the brother or sister of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, but the rich person is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away, but the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, and its flowers fall off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So also the rich person in the midst of his pursuits will die out. Well, um, many people read this and go, what in the world is verse 9 through 11? Well, it's very simple, actually. First, it starts with verse 9. It talks about that brother or sister of humble circumstances. Um, that's maybe a poor, but maybe just humble circumstances. You're not raised up in any way. And he says that person should glory in their high position. Well, what's the high position of somebody humble, somebody poor, a beggar on the street? Well, if they're a believer, remember, if they're a brother or sister, if they're a believer, what is their high position? What true position do they have? Well, they're a child of the king. They're the child of the king of kings. They're a princess of the king of kings. Of the, there's no one above them. This person who is living here on earth for the short time, for a little while, if necessary, if you remember your homework, um, is in a situation of humble circumstances. But the reality is, as soon as the Lord comes back, and when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, that this person will be standing with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and everyone will know who you really are. So if you're a person of humble circumstances, you can glory in your true high position, that one day it will be revealed who you really are. <coughs> the verses 10 and 11 talk about, okay, let's talk about the rich person. What about them? You know, they have a lot of things. What are they supposed to glory in? Because they already have their glory. Well, the rich person, uh, there's a brother or sister, they're supposed to glory in their humiliation. Humiliation? How? They aren't humiliated. Oh, uh, let's think about that for a second. And what the text is saying is that the rich person is supposed to realize that like flowering grass, he's going to go away. The sun rises, the heat, the withers, the grass, the flower falls, beauty appearances. It all is going to go away. Don't be so proud of your earthly wealth. What's going to happen to it? It's all going to be burned up. Wealth is very deceptive. It's really of no value. It only seems value for this little time if necessary. Um, I like that line that says, fame, youth, and beauty, hurry by. Meaning, you know, it's like you, you have it for a moment, but it's so fleeting. When you were popular for a second, I remember who was popular when I was a kid, and now I, I look at, you know, where are they now? And it's like you sort of go, wow, <laughs> it went by. They aren't so pretty anymore. They aren't, so, they aren't famous anymore. Fame, youth beauty are so short and fleeting that it really is of no value and the the humiliation is that you actually thought it was of value it's actually um 
sad to see people that are famous uh, uh, movie stars that um, I've lived in um, Hollywood and famous movie, movie stars that are nothing now and work in very low positions that it's very hard for them because they had uh, what they thought was something when in reality they're nothing. So what the Bible's saying is for a rich person, glory in your humiliation that you'd actually think that was a value and that you'll, you'd be humiliated to think that I had any value of that at all. Sort of, um, there was a town once that they decided that they were going to let the water through and flood the town. Do you think it would be wise for them to invest um, in the month before that was to happen, to invest in fixing up their house and painting it and planting beautiful flowers and, and saying, wow, I've got the best house in the neighborhood or um, wow, I'm the mayor of this town when a month later it's going to be totally flooded and gone. No, it's silly to invest in that. Why? And it just, that would be humiliation. Humiliation is saying that you actually spent money to say you had the best or you looked the best or you were the prettiest when it's all going to fade away and go. So that's what it's talking about there. It sort of summarizes the whole thing in verse 12, and that's why we ended verse 12 this week. In blessed is the man who perseveres, who bomone, under a trial, remaining under that pressure. Why? Why is that person blessed? Because it doesn't look like they'd be blessed. That is definitely God's wisdom. Why? For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What's the crown of life? Eternal life. It's not a crown. It's not royalty. It's eternal life. That's what they're going to get. Blessed is the man who remains under trials. The result of those who truly believe, those who hupomone, who prove that they love the Lord, well, they will be blessed. Trials and troubles don't change our love. They deepen it. Um, you know, when I got married to my husband, and uh, at the time, I was young, <laughs> and others were saying, oh, you know, we love you, but they didn't really love me. Dave said he loved me, but now, after almost 41 years and living with me as difficult as I can be, as sometimes I'm encouraging, but most of the time I drive him nuts. Um, I'm hard to live with, I'm sick, and he has to take care of me during that, and, and uh, um, I'm not pretty anymore. Uh, now I'm starting to realize, actually, he really does love me. Why? Because he's remained. He's remained under. He's been faithful. He keeps going. He keeps putting up with me. <laughs> and that's how I know that he really, truly loves me. Well, trials and your persevering, your hupomone, really proves who you love and who you're trusting. There's a difference between those that are, the seed has um, gone on the rock of rocky and thorny. The both of them, all three, does the good soil, the rocky soil, and the thorny soil, all of them hear the word of God. And all of them understand it. But one plants roots deep, truly loves, truly depends. The others have light, light roots. And so in time, as trials and the, the storms come and the hard things happen in life, the one on the rocky soil and the one on the thorny, the rocky soil will just, it won't make it. The wind will just blow it away. All of that truth will just be blown away because they're so deceived by the cares of this world. And the one on the thorny um, will be choked out because they'll be like, oh, I just, I, I'm so worried about things of this world and so focused on that. So what's the difference 
between the one who truly loves and the one who doesn't love God. Well, the difference is there's a selfish friendship with God that some people have. Their motive, their entire motive is their own personal happiness. They're not loving God. They love self. They delight in their own happiness. They focus on the here and now. They only see by sight what they see. That person is eternally damned. That person will be separated from God because they don't have true faith, true saving faith. But what is that true love, that true saving faith for God? That person recognizes that they needed to be reconciled with God. They are not, they, they needed God to find a way to help the separation from their sin to get to God. And they found Jesus to reconcile them. They think about God and his son and his character. That's what they spend time pondering in their head. They see not by what they see, but they see by faith that God is doing something, that he is, that he's really here, and that he will reward as I under. They see what's unseen. They know that God's ways are good and the best way. And, and as they struggle sometimes, they think, oh, I don't want to go through this. I don't want life to go this way. I have a different plan. And they know the, the pupomone, the person who hangs in, the person who truly has believed, will rebuke themselves and will come and align themselves back with God and say, you know what, God? No. Your ways are best. I do not trust myself at all. I don't trust my own knowledge. I will trust you that you are good and your plan is the best. They know that God is the only way that they'll get any good out of life. And so they seek him, they cling to him, they need him. That's the difference. Psalm 73. This is the heart of a true believer. Psalm 73, verses 25 through 28 says this. You can close your eyes if you'd like as I read it. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And you, and with you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so that I may tell of all your works. That's a true believer. That's the heart of a true believer. Whom do I have in heaven but God? And nothing on earth is more valuable than that. I love my husband. He's a wonderful man. But even he can't satisfy everything I need. The only one that can satisfy is God. Now sometimes the Lord uses my husband, sometimes the Lord uses things on this earth to um, give to me, to have me see how good he is. But I know the source is God. Whom do I have in heaven but him? And with you I desire nothing on the earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The nearness of God is my good. Well, I hope this helped getting you a little bit more understanding and every week we'll get a little deeper. But I'd like to challenge you today that as you pray for one another in your groups and you find out what are the desires that they have of Aunt Sally's being healed and, you know, whatever, <laughs> but that you pray for one another, but pray with this in mind. Lord, 
strengthen their backs. Make their faith stronger. Don't let this crush their faith. Lord, how can I come alongside them so their faith will not fail? So that it won't, this trial won't be overwhelming to them. Remember how Jesus prayed for Peter when he said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed that the Lord will restore you. Pray that, that we can keep persevering, hupomone, until we see him face to face. When he comes back, will he find faith in you? That's the question. And that's what we have to battle is do we constantly believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him? Well, now let's finish as we always do. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, keep you in hupomone, he's able to do that and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time, and now and forever. Amen.